We welcome friends who have joined us on the BGF Facebook Live for the photographic travel log to Budgaya and Saranath this afternoon. We are joined by our members as well as friends from the World Fellowship of Buddhist Youths, the Theravada Buddhist Council of Malaysia, Mahindarama Sunday Pali School in Penang, Taiping Insight Meditation Society, the Mudita Buddhist Society in Kalang, Johor Gladian's Meta Buddhist Fellowship, Kinara Meta Buddhist Society, and friends uh, of Aloka. And of course, we have many friends who have joined the Maitri Enterprise organized tours that were led by me, and uh, of which there are many, including the Buddhist pilgrimage. Now, going for a religious or a spiritual journey to a sacred place is called a pilgrimage. It is a very special journey to make, but it depends on the motivation and the frame of mind of the pilgrims. The quality of one's pilgrimage vary, not so much of the sacred site or the travel arrangements, but the quality of the heart and mind of the pilgrim while making the journey. Buddhists are highly encouraged to go for a pilgrimage to places connected with the Buddha's life. Uh, the importance of this sacred journey was mentioned in the Mahaparinibbana Sutta, uh, which is the discourse that traces the last three months of the Buddha's life. When a pilgrim goes with a heart and mind full of sincerity and dedication, the experience of connecting with the Buddha by retracing the master's first step is an act of great merit that is clearly imprinted in the mind. And the imprint is so strong that I believe that in the pilgrim's final moments, this will actually guide him or guide them on their onward journey. The four sacred places for Buddhists are Lumbini, which is the Buddha's birthplace, Budgaya, the site of enlightenment, Saranath, the place where the first sermon was taught, and Kushinara, the place where the Buddha passed away. This afternoon, the presentation will be on two out of the four holy places. Budgaya, where the Buddha gained enlightenment at the age of 35 years old, and he spent about seven weeks within in that vicinity of Budgaya, and after which he traveled 250 kilometers to meet up with the five monks in Saranath, who were his, their first disciples, uh, in order to teach the first sermon. Our speaker this afternoon is Brother Chong Wei Tat. He is an avid photographer and a host of uh, the online program called Photo Jam, which is held every evening from 8.30 to 10 p.m. I'm one of those fans of this photo jam. And when I'm free, I'll attend these programs. This program is actually started with the current lockdown, but it is an ongoing marathon. Every evening, there will be photograph, uh, photographers presenting their work and their photographic insights. Now, in 2007, Brother Wei Tat became a novice monk at the Brookfield Mahavihara under Bante Mahinda. Uh, the following year, Wei Tat had the unique opportunity of organizing, of being in the organizing committee of the Aloka Novitiate program in Budgaya, where a record of 300 people participated in that program. And Wei Tat himself has gone for the pilgrimage three times. And the last and the third time was with his parents. So we'd like to invite Brother Wei Tat to make his presentation. Wei Tat, the platform is for you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, um, Datu Sri. Uh, it's such a pleasure to have a platform today to actually like share my photos. And I still, I think my my impression of both Gaia Force, you know, my affinity to that place is obviously very strong because, you know, without without real planning, I've actually been there three times. Eh? So, and every time I've been there, you know, that sense of um, reverence is very strong, especially when I approach the Mahabodhi. Eh? So I think one of the things I'm going to be sharing today is my objective is this, you know, like the these places are very important for us to visit. Um, as a photographer, as well as for a Buddhist, I think these are places of uh, significance that we would definitely um, enjoy and we'll definitely have a deeper sense of understanding of the uh, Buddha's path, you know, you know, from the time he became en uh, enlightened, when he gave his first sermon, 
as well as you know when he attain he attain a pari bibana at the end. Yeah? So uh, I'm going to share my slides now. It's going to be quite fast paced, yeah? and I think we leave some uh, room at the end for us to uh, for us to uh, ask questions. Yeah? Let me let me share my slides. Yeah? Okay, so the it's called like the journey to explore the footsteps of the Buddha part one because we were supposed to have two trips. Yeah? Two zero, uh, two zero one nine, we were supposed to go to Bodh Gaya as well as Sarnath. And then the following year, 2020, we we're supposed to visit Lumbini as well as Sri Naga. Uh, and then as a matter of Anicca, you know, that didn't happen, you know, because you know what happened in 2020. But still, you know, we relish what happened, uh, you know, the trip that we did in uh, 2019 in Bodh Gaya. Okay, as um, Dato Sri had mentioned, uh, this the Buddha actually encouraged us to visit these places uh, at, the, uh, at the at the just before he died at the you know it's actually noted down in the Maha Parinibbana Sutta. So it's something that the the uh, Buddha had encouraged to do, and then. Uh, this is something that Bhante Mahinda taught us. The reason that we keep we should go back to these places is because life after life, if we go back, you know, we would actually form a nimitta of that place, you know, and therefore we would actually form a past life experience that, that when we go to that place, we would actually recollect, you know, why we went back in the first place. You know? uh, when we actually went with the first set of pilgrims, three hundred of them, many of them shed tears, many of them cried, you know, not knowing why they did so, because and. The explanation is not, this is not probably the first time they've actually seen it. Eh? Now, this is my journey, okay, very quickly. You know, it's like, it was say nine days, uh, eight, eight days and nine, uh, nine, uh, nine days and uh, eight days, eight evenings of staying. Eh? Uh, of course, to go to Bodh Gaya, you have to transit in uh, Bangkok. And on the way back, you actually have to stay in Bangkok for one day. So this is my trip. Eh? So if you look at it, you know, from Kuala Lumpur, to Bangkok is a two hour trip. You probably transit there for two or three hours. And then from Bangkok to Gaia is actually three hours. So when you look at it, it's actually quite a manageable trip. It's not difficult at all to go to Bodh Gaya from Malaysia. We're actually quite fortunate. Eh? On my party, we had 19 travelers. Our spiritual guide uh, was uh, Bhante Sri Dharma. Our tour leaders was Brother Herman and Sister Ling Ling from ETN. And as I said, this is first of a two part trip. Eh? We didn't uh, you know, some trips, they, they would squeeze like all four locations in, in maybe a 10 or 14 day period. But, you know, we were, we, we, we didn't want to sort of like uh, rush ourselves too much and give us a bit of time to actually appreciate the sites, especially since I was going there for the third time, as well as I had my camera with me, as well as I was bringing my parents with me. My parents are in their 80s, so can you imagine? And I didn't want this to be too rush a trip for them. Okay, as all trips, we, this is actually our, when we landed at Bodh Gaya Airport. And you can see uh, Bhante Sri Dharma as well as uh, Brother Herman is actually in, in, in this group picture that we had. Uh, this is the bus that we had. There were 19 of us, so we were not too packed in the bus. Eh? And uh, when we landed in Bodh Gaya, first place we went to is actually we took a tuk tuk to the uh, Mahabodhi Temple. Eh? Okay, and this is what you would typically see when you actually travel on a, a street in India. You see uh, rickshaws, you see people, you see cows, you see cars, you see everything. Everything's on the road. It's a very messy place by, 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 by any measure. Okay. Now, this is when we actually walk towards the Mahabodhi. The feeling I get when I see this is just an anticipation and joy because you know you're going to be at the doorstep of the uh, Mahabodhi very shortly. So this is the entrance to the uh, main shrine. Eh? Within the main shrine, there's a Buddha image and we, we're coming there towards the evening now. So uh, I'm going to show you another set of photos where we come in the morning to pay respect properly. Uh, so this is our party, you know, the you know, sister Ling Ling, um, Bante. And this is actually what you see when you actually uh, approach the main shrine. Now, the main shrine itself is very small. Eh? 
uh, and it's actually, I mean, to go in, you don't really have a lot of time to, to, to spend in there. Once you go in, you have to, to pay your respect and then you come out. Uh, fortunately for me and for the elderly, they actually uh, give you a bit more assistance to actually go into this place. Uh. So for people who are older, people who are disabled, I would still encourage you to go to this place because they do make a, uh, they do make uh, special allowances for you to actually go in and the guards will actually help you to the front of the altar for you to pay respect. Eh? So this is uh, paying respects to the Buddha. You said that's my mother there. My mother is in her 80s and it's the first time for her to, to visit this place at the, at the, um, to, to pay respect to the Buddha image at the Mahabodhi. Eh? For me, this is a great sense of joy you know, for, for a son to bring their parents to the Mahabodhi. Eh? You know, to, to pay respects to the Buddha, can you imagine the sense of joy that I had? Uh, just a bit of background for this trip. When we made this trip, many times when we make trips, we sort of plan, or when we plan the trip, you know, and then we call out family members, people cannot make it, people have busy, people are working, people have other things to do. For me, you know, when the opportunity to this trip came up, I just say we book it first and then we plan later, you know. We make sure everybody come, eh? So I think that's one of the things when you want to make a trip, especially an important one like this, you make explorations and, and when the opportunity presents itself, you just go. You don't, you don't try to make excuses why you cannot go because at any point in our life, there are excuses. And I'm so glad that we made this trip because we made this trip in 2019. Imagine 2020, we didn't know, know that we we're going to be hit by a century the cycle pandemic and then we are all locked in now for the 18 months so i'm so glad that we made this trip and i'm so glad that i had the opportunity to bring my parents to this trip now this is a very sacred place when you go to the mahabodhi this is actually the uh the back where the the bodhi tree is behind the bodhi tree there is a diamond throne that's actually uh um built by um, King Asoka. So this is the place where the Buddha actually sat, meditated and attained, uh, attained uh, you know, Nibbana at this very spot. So can you imagine the sense of reverence when you actually sit there? You know, of course, this is not the original Bodhi tree, but it's, it's supposed to be the original descendant of the original Bodhi tree from uh, at the, from the time of the Buddha. So can you imagine uh, the sense of reverence when you actually sit in this spot? Okay. Now this is uh, still the Mahabodhi in the evening. So in the evening, they light it up. It's a very beautiful place because they have like lights. Uh, as a photographer, you can see, you can get very interesting images here. And then you see photos, you see in India, it's also a very interesting place photographically because you see a lot of people, you know, you see a lot of uh, monks, you see a lot of people in different dresses, you see, you know, people um, all from all walks of life eh? and someone with a camera in, in uh, India is actually a very comfortable for you to take photos. People don't mind photos being taken. This is the road to the way to the Mahabodhi. Eh? So it's, it's actually a very busy place. You walk down this street, eh? you find there are vendors, there are monks, there are all sorts of vehicles around this place. For those of you who've been to the uh, pilgrimages to Mahabodhi, you will recognize this road very well because you will probably travel through this road every morning and every evening when you come back from the Mahabodhi. And um, you will take a tuk-tuk typically because the buses cannot go right to the temple. So the buses will park about, you know, probably about 500 meters away and you probably walk or you have to take a tuk-tuk to actually approach the Mahabodhi uh, complex. So, just to give you an idea, um, a lot of people, when they think about going to India, they think it's a very difficult, uncomfortable trip. But it's actually, yeah, you look at the place where we stayed there, yeah? It's actually very comfortable. We had like a four star type treatment every evening. We had good food. We had clean sheets. Eh? So, you know, like uh, even for myself who, who's traveling with a wheelchair, I managed to stay very comfortably. I see, you know, so 
this place is new. It's called the Oaks Hotel, but it's a fantastic, fantastic place. Eh? Okay, this is the next morning. We are going to the Mahabodhi again. Again, this is my mom and my sister uh, taking a tuk-tuk. Eh? And in the morning, you go there, you find uh, there are people, Buddhists of different traditions practicing there. You see Tibetan monks, you see the Thais there, you see the Burmese, you see the Sri Lanka circulating the, the Mahabodhi. So, and you see a lot of like the Tibetan Buddhist prostrating, you know, full body prostration. So when you go there in the morning, it, the, the feeling is just incredibly magical. And from a photographer also, it's, it's a fantastic place because you just get all these beautiful images. Eh? So for me, it's I'm mixed because I have a camera in hand. At the same time, you know, I'm, I'm also attending this as a pilgrim. Eh? So imagine, you know, whenever I'm, I have the opportunity, my, my photographic hat will come on and I'll try and take images that, that I see around me. This is another image that I caught. So imagine you see, uh, you have uh, monks with different, different robes, you know, speaking and talking and imagine, you know, they are debating about the Dhamma and sharing their life, their, exp their spiritual experiences as a Buddhist. Now, this is the rear gate of the Mahabodhi. Yeah? Um, I like taking this picture because it's, you know, it's got structure, there's a, there's a, uh, lighting that comes into this place and there there would typically be a bit of like uh, people in this area. So I always like taking photos in this area. I've rendered in the black and white just to give it a bit of emphasis as to, you know, the stone structure as well as the people in it. And if you see, the Mahabodhi has a lot of intricate uh, details around the place. Eh? So this is just one of the, the one of the intricacies that I've caught with my camera. You don't need a very high-end camera, even if you have a handphone or if you have a good eye for detail, the, the place is abound with all these things for you to take as a photographer. Yeah. Now, after we've like uh, visited the main shrine, um, Bhante's, Bhante Sri Dharma took us around the, the Mahabodhi complex to look around the place. As you know, the, the, after the Buddha attained enlightenment, he spent seven weeks around the Bodhi tree. Yeah? And uh, there's actually a story for each week that he spent there. And many of those stories and places are actually around the Mahabodhi. Yeah? This is the rear of the Mahabodhi. This is the front. And this is a photo that I particularly like because whenever I sleep, I dream, this is what I see in the morning. This is the nimitta that I have image in my mind. You know, whenever I, I think of myself uh, going to the Mahabodhi, this is the image that appears. Yeah? Because when in the morning, you have to travel very early to the Mahabodhi, five or six in the morning, you queue up. And as you're queuing up, you know, you, you set your motivation of why you're coming here and when you're setting your motivation this is the image that you see yeah so for me this is actually the essence of what i see when i go to the mahabodhi i've been there three times and every time you know i close my eyes this is the image that will come up for me when i'm there when i see in person you know my heart just fills with joy yeah? you know and peace yeah? and when i go away this is still the image that i still retain that i truly really treasure So these are the, I just took note of the, uh, you know, the, 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 the seven weeks after the, the, the Buddha spent around the Bodhi tree after it attained enlightenment. Eh? I leave it to you because it's actually quite a lot of detail in that. There's stories in every single week. Yeah, but if you spend time around the Mahabodhi complex, you find all these places. Eh? Yeah, and you see some of the places actually have a plot that explains, you know, what, what the uh you know after the enlightenment of the buddha why which week he spent in this place and what he did so there are actually plugs around the whole complex that explains the seven weeks after the buddha's enlightenment yeah so we were very lucky because we had bhante sri dhamma there to actually guide us through all the seven places and then you can see you know he's a very uh enthusiastic monk eh? <laughs> 
So this is our group. Uh, I'm not, we're going to show a lot of group photos in here because we many of the places that we took after we sort of like uh, concluded we took a group photo. So as you can see, you know, I, we had quite a mixed group of people there. There's uh, uh, younger people. The youngest would have been, been my nephew. He would have been he would have been eleven at the time. And then I think the oldest would have been my father. My father was like 80, 81 or 82 when he traveled to Bodh Gaya. Yeah, that's another view of Bodh Gaya from, from the side. Uh, one thing that you see when in Bodh Gaya, if you're lucky sometimes, you see the Tibetan monks, you would actually go around giving butter, butter tea. Yeah? So if you get that opportunity, you know, I think it's a very much a Tibetan tradition. Even if you go to places like uh, the Ramsala, where, where the uh, Dalai Lama has his uh, uh, monastery, yeah? if you go in the morning, they would serve, uh, they would serve sometimes the bread and the butter tea. Yeah? So in this morning, they, they were going around serving butter tea as well. Uh, this is the bank you see on the lake. This is the Muchalinda Lake. Eh? There's actually a, again, it, it relates to one of the weeks in which the Buddha spent uh, after he attained enlightenment at the uh, Mahabodhi. Yeah. So this is, I think this is the best spot for a group photo to, to take a group photo at the, uh, with the Mahabodhi at the background. Eh? Because Otherwise, there's nowhere around the complex where you can easily take a group photo where you, because the Mahabodhi temple itself is quite tall. Eh? And if you have a big group, you need to be able to stand far enough back to actually take this photo. So this photo was taken next to the Ahsoka Tower. Eh? So if you have a big group, I would, I, I've been there three times. I think this is the best place to take a group photo if you have a large group. Now, this is the site of the complex. Again, if you, one of the things you do uh, as part of the visit of the Mahabodhi is to circum circumambulate the, the, the temple complex itself uh, by three rounds. Eh? Um, and as you're going around, you see there are people like offering, there are people meditating, there are people prostrating, there would be people like, uh, you know, like offering flowers and incense. So, you know, if you go around, you actually get to see a lot of like uh, uh, true reverence around the place. It's actually very, very motivating. Um, this is something that you probably do not get to see very much. Eh? But if you actually look closely at the detail of the Mahabodhi, you actually see there's a lot of detail within the carvings itself. You know? There are Buddha images from different periods. There are like, uh, you know, there are, if you count the number of like items, you know, many of them, there are five, seven, or nine, 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 nine uh, items in it, and they are all all have the Buddhist significance in those numbers. Huh? Uh, group photo in front of the Mahabodhi, and then just a close-up photo. This so this is again a group photo of all of us who were there. Yeah. So as I say, today I'm actually showing this place from a standpoint as a pilgrim, as well as a photographer. As a photographer, you can see there's, you know, like I just spent a, photos from one evening and one morning. You see there are a lot of wonderful photos from this place. So I think some of the people joining to uh, this uh, sharing are going to be photographers. I would still encourage you, even if you're not a Buddhist, do go to this place. It is wonderful. It is amazing. And it's still a very, it's a very, very good place to visit if you want to take photos as well as to get, come to a place of a peace and reverence. Now you see, uh, one thing photographers like is, some photographers like to take landscapes, some photographers like to take people. And again, in the boat Gaya, there's lots of human interest for you to take. Yeah? Uh, again, you know, human interest uh, photos. Uh, uh, you find at the Mahabodhi, there are a lot of sadhus, which are people who are practicing on their own. Eh? They spend their time there, you see, and you get a lot of the, many sadhus there, and uh, you get a lot of beautiful character photos there, and the, and it's very easy to photograph them because, you know, they, they are used to being photographed, and you, they don't mind, you know. I mean, as long as you approach them politely, ask for permission, you see this old man here smiling at me, eh? 
and basically you know we 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 we, we just like you know like um asked his permission and we took a photo with him yeah and you see this is just peeking through the trees you can see the number of pilgrims in the morning yeah? i couldn't get a very close photo because i i i was actually together with my group of uh, 18 19 people but imagine uh, one day if i go back there as a photographer i can spend time there you know in the morning to try and get some photos i'm sure you know this place is just you know a treasure trove for photography just look at that then i just point my camera anywhere yeah? you you get this beautiful like geometric shapes you have uh you know like a, pe a human interest you have colors you know you have a lot of geometry in the photos yeah, yeah? And again, human interest everywhere you walk, you know, people turn around smiling at you because you're holding a camera. For me, because I'm going there in a wheelchair, I, I get a lot of attention. Yeah? People will turn around and wonder, you know, why why is why do you have this funny Chinese guy going around in the wheelchair and his camera? Huh? Uh, again, human interest, you know. So so I mean if you imagine, you know, um you don't have to go all the way to Tibet to get a photo like this. You know, this is a five-hour flight from Kuala Lumpur. Eh? Jane, human interest. Eh? So for me, with my camera, non-stop, I have things to take. Yeah, even though I'm taking landscapes, I'm taking the uh, Mahabodhi, I'm taking you know the, the party around me. I also have a lot of opportunity to take human interest all around me. Yeah? Again, okay, yeah. And this is just the one thing about India you find is a very colorful place, eh? which is which photographers love, yeah. Everything is colorful, you know. Tuk tuks are colorful, what they wear is colorful, you know. You go to any shop is colorful, yeah. So again, you know, from from a photography standpoint, there's a lot you're not you there's no shortage of subject matters for you to take, yeah. Uh, this is us in the tuk-tuk. So every morning we'll go there. Each tuk-tuk will take four people. Imagine we have to take five tuk-tuks to the Mahabodhi every morning. And the tuk-tuk itself is an experience in itself. Now I'm going to share a video here. I'm not sure whether you can hear it. Um, tell me if you don't hear the sound. Are you able to hear the sound? Okay. Thank you. This is morning at the Diamond Throne. Eh? And as you can see, you hear chanting everywhere. You hear chanting of all different traditions when you're there.
Okay, so next part of the trip now. That's uh, the first part you just showing the Mahabodhi. Now, around the Mahabodhi temple, there are actually quite a number of places of significance that we can keep travel to. Eh? So the, the first place we went to was Prabodhi Hill. Prabodhi Hill is a place that the Siddhartha practiced uh, before enlightenment. He practiced for six years, uh, as it was documented. Eh? Uh, a very austere uh, form of practice eh? where, you know, and you, you see there's a uh, Siddhartha image where he saw almost just bone and skin. Eh? So India, we're traveling. We had to travel by bus to this place and you, you it takes you to the bottom of the field. At the bottom of the field, you actually have to actually walk up the walk up to this place or you can actually get someone to actually take you on a motorbike. Eh? This is my sister in here, been taken in a motorbike. Uh, this Bante, Bante is uh, healthy. He decided to walk. Yeah, and it's I'm not. It wasn't too long, far a walk up. If I'm not mistaken, it took us about 15, 20 minutes to walk up to this hill. And when you walk up to this hill, you come to this landing here. At this landing, you see there are a lot of pilgrims. Yeah, and you see there's just a little small cave. That you find that the uh, entrance to the cave is very small, but inside this is what you see. Yeah. This is actually the uh, Buddha image of Siddhartha. Siddhartha, the uh, image eh, of him practicing before he came became um, enlightened. So we we went to this place. We took a group photo, and as in all pilgrimages, uh, it's uh, not uh, unusual to meet. Uh, uh friends that we know eh? so we were luck very lucky on that day on this that day we met uh i think many of you will recognize uh, but um brother tan was there also he brought a big you know uh, a lot of pilgrims came with him i'm not sure i think his group at at, at least like uh um 60 or 70 people in his group eh? so we bump into brother tan eh? And this is us coming down from uh, Prak Bodhi Hill. Um, and took a tuk tuk uh, back. Now, we took a tuk tuk out. This is the, in and around Bodh Gaya. There are many temples and monasteries that you should try and visit if you, if you spend your time there. Because, like, uh, the, uh, apart from the Mahabodhi, every major country has built a temple in in Bodh Gaya itself eh? so the thais have a temple the bhutanese have a temple the burmese have a temple the japanese have a temple and i think all the tibetan sects also have a temple in that place eh? so this is the bhutanese monastery i like going to the bhutanese monastery because it's very um the the interior of the temple is very beautifully carved eh? there are a lot of like uh, beautiful buddha images you see on the walls there's a lot of intricate uh um you know uh, murals as well as like uh, paintings and you see that's a very nice uh, guru rinpoche uh, image as well eh? at the Bhutanese temple so if you don't have a lot of time i would suggest uh, if you go to Bodh Gaya, just mark all the the major temples that you would like to visit eh? the 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 ones that i always go to would be the Bhutanese temple the thai temple uh, as well as the great Buddha image that's uh, built by the Japanese. Eh? So the second day we would, uh, this is now the third day, we actually uh, went out on another day trip on two places. One is Suyata village, which is just across on the, the, the river. It's called, uh, there's a village there called Bako. And the other place that we went to was Gaya Sister Hill. Eh? Gaya, Gaya, Gaya Sister Hill is uh, later I'll explain to you. It's actually a place where the Buddha uh, did a, the fire sermon for a thousand, thousand ascetics and uh, converted them into Buddhism. So this is the morning we came out, Suyata Stupa. Uh, we spent a bit of time there because apart from the stupa, that this is it's just a stupa in the middle of a field. Eh? This is Suyata Stupa. And uh, close by, there's a Suyata temple. Eh? Suyata temple is supposed to be a place where the Buddha was offered um, uh, offered uh, milk rice by uh, 
by Suyata when he was meditating under the tree. Yeah? So you see there's actually a, a temple here. And you find when you go to these places, there's a lot of people explaining the, the, the significance and relevances of these places. Uh, we just happened to bump into a person that was explaining to us about this well. I don't ex understand, I don't remember the specific story about this well. Eh? But you know, but, it, uh, but this is actually part of the uh, Suyata temple. And there's a shrine outside. Eh? Coming out of the temple, this is the view back into Bodh Gaya. So you see there's actually um, the Mahabodhi temple in, in, in the background and you can see the river. The river is actually a very shallow river with, with, uh, with a sort of sand plain on it. Eh? Now this is, uh, after that we try, travel to a place called Gaya Sisa. Now this is the uh, first time I've been to this place because this is actually not part of the normal uh, pilgrimage trip. Man. I think we, we put it into our program as something that we wanted to see. Yeah? It was uh, very interesting. Now one thing I like to, like to, the first time when I actually went on this pilgrimage, you know, I, I don't think I was so familiar with the suttas then. Nah? But now, uh, whenever I go to a place, I, I, I always ask uh, what is his references to the sutta. Eh? So if we look at this sutta, Evang Mi Suttam, thus I heard Evang Samayan Bhagava on one time the Blessed One. Gaya Yam Viharati, in Gaya he dwelt. Eh? Gaya Sisa Sadim Bhikkhu Sasa Sena. Okay? In Gaya head with monks, 1,000 of them. Eh? So Gaya Sisa is the place that we're going to, and it's actually referenced in the Sutta. Eh? Yeah, that at this place, he gave this uh, fire sermon to a thousand monks. Eh? So places like this where there are direct references to the Sutta, I think are places that are very significant in the life of the Buddha. So Gaya Sisa Hill, you know, it's uh, 424 steps. We climbed up, you know, even my uh, 80, my, my father, who was 81 at the time, managed to climb up. It's quite an achievement for him. Eh? Yeah. So you look at it, we climb up this, this hill, and that's, the, that's the, the town in the background. And look at it, it's a beautiful view when we actually reach the top, the summit of this place. Eh? Um, they just recently started building a, uh, a, Buddha, uh, a, a Buddha image there. I think it's something that uh, people have recognized that this is a place of uh, important significance. And for us, we we uh, we uh, recited the Adipariya Ya Sutta there, the fire sermon discourse uh, uh, together with uh, led by uh, Bhante Sri Dhamma. Now you look at this photo. I just, I mean, I didn't plan this photo, but just look at the lighting. Yeah? I mean, this this is sort of like almost like a a a. Uh, a magic moment you know when we did this when, when we did this uh uh prayer and then you the the clouds just broke through and you see this lights coming from behind the clouds eh? yeah so this is us the uh, all of us managed to make it to the top eh? all 19 of us eh? That's including me, you know, in, uh, I wear a prosthetic leg and I actually managed to climb up this hill myself. Eh? So for anybody, you know, yeah, even if you're a bit elderly, this is definitely quite, quite doable. On the way down, um, you know, in India, you see a lot of this, you see a lot of people like um, uh, begging for, for, you know, for, for food and money. Eh? So this is actually quite, a, especially in the state of Bihar, because Bihar is actually one of the poorest states in India. Yeah, Brother Herman there. Okay, coming down the view, looking towards the town. Uh, Bhante as he's walking down. And this is my father. He made, he was so happy when he made it down. Eh? Imagine climbing up and climbing down. This was such an achievement for my father. You can see the sense of relief and joy when he arrived at the ground. Eh? And of course, in India, you see a lot of like a random animals as well. Cows, you see a lot of cows. 
Now, this is after we went back to our hotel. We had a quick shower change and we were we 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 came out again. Eh? And this is at the came coming out from the Oaks Hotel. Um and then going back into uh, Bodh Gaya. Bodh Gaya, again, as I said, there are many temples. One of the things that we always visit when we go to Bodh Gaya is a great Buddha image. This great uh, this uh, image was made in uh, 1989. It's 80 feet high, and it was actually consecrated by the uh, 14 Dalai Lama at the time. Okay. Okay, so that concludes my our trip to the uh, to uh, Bodh Gaya. So Bodh Gaya, I sh showed you the Mahabodhi. I showed you the places that we went to around it. The next place we went to was actually towards uh, towards Rajgir. Rajgir is actually the place, another place of very important significance for the Buddha because there, you know, is the Vulture's Peak. Yeah? And we play, we stayed at this place here. It's called the Indo Hoki. Yeah? Um, it's a very, uh, it's actually a, built by a Japanese, it's actually a Japanese, um, uh, almost like a Japanese monastery temple place. Eh? The place is quite straightforward, but very clean, very comfortable, and actually had a very nice uh, sh shrine hall that we meditated in every morning. Eh? So the place, place we went to is the Bim Bim Sara's uh, jail. Eh? Bim Bim Sara was actually one of the uh, Buddha's uh, patrons, uh, rich patrons. Eh? that uh, provided him with the um, bamboo grove for him to give his sermons. So the Buddha spent a lot of time in this uh, place, you know, in, in, in the earlier part of his life. Uh, you can actually look up the story of Bibing Sara, but this was actually a jail that he, um, the son put uh, King Bibing Sara in this jail. Uh, and it's not, it's a very small place, but actually you can see that the jail, the stones are still there after if you look at the life of the Buddha, this is 2,600 years later, you know, this place still exists. Now, this place we're going to is the bamboo grove. Now, again, you look at the bamboo grove. Uh, the, when I first went there, you know, I didn't know the significance of it. But if you start any sutta, you see, Ewang Mi Suttam Thas, I've heard, E Kam Samayam Bhagawai Raja Gahe Viharati. Yeah? At the fortunate time, the, at the time, the fortunate one was dwelling near Raja Gaha, which is this place. Value vena kalandaka ni vape, you know, at the squirrels feeding place in bamboo wood. Eh? So imagine if you if you read the sutta and the sutta starts like this, you know this was actually the where the, the Buddha actually gave this sermon from. Eh? So this is the bamboo grove. Another must uh, visit place if you do uh, uh, do a pilgrimage tour to uh, to to India. We went there and there's a place we did uh we did a small puja there uh, and again you know i get lots of opportunities to use my camera as well now this is uh vouchers peak vouchers peak is actually going the place to go towards um uh, uh, uh in rush gear to go towards the place where the buddha spent a lot of his time eh? now this place is very important the buddha actually med uh, was documented he spent a lot of time in vouchers peak he did a lot of meditation there many of the uh many of the you know the uh ananda as well as uh um kasapa you know have have like uh spent time in this place as well um to go there the first place you go to is a peace stupa and you find you have to take a cable car there this this uh, ride is actually a bit scary now you think about it because eh? you're suspended in a very small like uh simple uh, cable car and the only thing holding you back is a little bar that doesn't seem to be very secure eh? but after you take this ride you come to this place here this piece super was actually built by the japanese in 19, 19, uh, 1969 if i'm not mistaken eh? yeah it's called the japanese peace park if you take a trip you will always go to this place uh very nice very serene uh, and you again you know you go there you do second bullet there three times eh? Then you come back down to the cable car, and then this is the other walk up to the uh, Vouchers Peak. Eh? The Vouchers Peak, actually, there are two ways of going up. Eh? One, you can hike up if you're able body, but for me, as well as for people with LLDB, you have the option to actually have a, a human chariot to bring you up. Eh? 
So this is my father on the human chariot. Uh, as you go up, you will pass a few caves. Some of the caves are very important because like, for example, this is Ananda's cave. Uh, you come up to landings. And the reason Vouchers Peak, called Vouchers Peak, is the peak is there's supposed to be a stone that looks like a voucher with its uh, wings folded. Eh? Uh, I'm too close, I don't really get a good view here, but I took this second photo with a, my iPhone, which has a wider lens. You can actually see the, the, the whole structure of the, the stone much better here. Now we went up there and at the end of Vouchers Peak, you come to this landing. You find the landing itself is not very big. Eh? The, the, main, the main place where you have a shrine is quite small, you, you know, and you see it's a place that's very busy because it's important for the um, for Theravada Buddhism as well as for the Mahayana, for Mahayana Buddhism as well. Eh? So you find this place whenever you go up there, it's actually a place that's very uh, busy. Eh? You go in there, we, uh, we sit down, we do our sutta and then we leave. Eh? We, we did our uh, Bojanga Sutta when we were there. Yeah, and again we did this when it was evening. You can see the sun and uh, just setting behind us. This is uh, from the other direction with the vouchers peak behind us, and then this is a picture photo of a brother Herman and a sister Ling Ling. You see how beautiful the sunlight is at the back. Eh? I'm going to play another video here. <laughs> Hey, here, come out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, you're all small at the back. Oh, Okay, so that's uh, Raj here. So the next place we went to from there is another place. Uh, uh, by then, we already staying in the Indohoki. Eh? The next logical place for us to go is the Satapani Cave. Eh? Now, Satapani Cave is actually very important. I, I, it's also my first time being going there, but uh, it wasn't part of the initial pilgrimage. But this is the cave. This is the place that the um, first Buddhist council was held after the death of the Buddha. You know? So can you imagine, you know, this is a place that I think Ananda, Ananda attained uh, enlightenment uh, the, the night before, you know, the, the, the actual like council itself. Eh? So you look at this place again, it's a very beautiful place, eh? a very, and very interesting as well to, to, to visit. Eh? Again, it's a hill, you have to climb up there. And now this hill is actually quite challenging to get up. Yeah? It's uh, much higher, it's quite steep. And, uh, or, or, and uh, I think compared to um, Orchard's Peak, it's probably a bit more difficult to climb up to this hill. So for me, I actually use a human chariot as well. Yeah, human chariot. Oh, my father in a human chariot again. And this is the cave itself, yeah? Now, if you look at this cave, uh, uh, 
look at this. You know, if you just look up uh, the first Buddhist council, uh, you find this photo. Uh, you like you find this photo on the internet, you know. And if you read it, uh, you know, five hundred hands, you know, uh, after the Buddha's death, the council headed by Venerable Mahakasapa, Venerable Ananda, you know, and uh, uh, was there, you know, uh, reciting the Dhamma. And Venerable Upali recited the Vinaya. And the events lasted for seven months. The Tripitaka was actually compiled during this first council. Yeah? So when like, you actually go to this cave, you realize how important it is yeah, from a, from a, for the Buddhist canon. Yeah? So this is the cave itself from outside. Yeah? And again, you go there, you find there are many, many pilgrims to this place, uh, both for Theravadans as well as Mahayanas. This is a view from inside the cave. I particularly like this photo because uh, it's not an easy photo to take. Uh, it's very bright outside. It's very dark inside. But, uh, you know, you still manage to see, like with this photo there, you can actually still get the photo of the people outside and the, the texture of the very dark inside part of the cave. Right? So when, when, when uh, and it's exactly how it looked like to my eyes when I was inside this cave. Yeah? And the sense of reverence knowing that, you know, this cave, nah, 2,600 years ago, uh, uh, you know, uh, we had 500 Arahants in this cave, yeah? you know, and uh, to form the basis of the Sutta uh, that we have today. Yeah? Okay, there are two caves in this area. In the smaller cave, we actually went in there and we actually recited a Metta Sutta led by Bhante Sri Dharma. Yeah. Again, when we were there, we came out. Uh, this is uh, we bump into uh, Brother Tan as well, and you see how big a group our Brother Tan uh, brought to you know on his entourage. Yeah? So anybody who actually uh, uh, was on this trip with uh, Brother Tan, you know, please you know just type a message in there and uh, say hi. Yeah? Now this is going down the, the going back down to the the foothills of the from uh, Sata Parni Cave. So this is a video. Okay, so this is after we came back down from the Saptapani cave. Eh? Uh, next place we went to that's important is Nalanda. Eh? Nalanda um, is a very big complex. It's actually, a, uh, if, um, it actually, once you go there, you realize how big and how important like Buddhism was in India you know, at one, point, one time in history. Yeah? Yeah? 
here you find uh, me, quite a uh, it's quite surprising quite quite a, a big part of the the temple complex is still intact yeah you can actually see the markings you can still see the brick you know it's actually a UNESCO site and you can I think if you actually go there and actually read up about it and study about it, it's a very interesting place to, to, to go. Eh? For me, we didn't have much time. Basically, we went in, we walked around, we walked back out. Eh? So I don't think we really did this place uh, justice. But I think if you have a bit more time, I'd definitely like to like spend a bit more time there. Uh, if you go with someone like uh, Brother Tan, he can explain to you all the history as well, all the significance of the, this place. Eh? As you can see, uh, it's, uh, you can walk through the whole Nalanda complex. Much of it is still intact, unlike a lot of ruins uh, where you just see like a rubble and stones on the floor. Now, this is the main structure that uh, most people would uh, use as a background when they want to take a photo on Nalanda. It's actually, I think, probably the most, uh, the, the, the structure that uh, has the most um, uh, uh intact parts in it including a tower okay and you see uh, on the sides there are many 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 stupas yeah apparently each stupa is a stupa built for an, an, an arahant eh? so if you look around you know i think you know there's a lot of hope for us to be arahants because uh, even the time of, of uh, Nalanda, you see many people attain Arahant. And the grounds are quite big. You look at the grounds, we actually walked around, it's very peaceful. We had a beautiful day and uh, we, you know, the weather was very good and we could, you know, you really can feel a sense of peace. If you want to go there and just sit down and meditate, then plenty of places, plenty of trees, plenty of quiet places for you to do so. Yeah. very green yeah so again you know here i am walking uh, driving past you know different places when we stop you know we happen to take like, like, photos of this uh, couple as i say india is, is a very interesting place if you have a camera there's lots of human interest there people are genuinely you know seem to be very contented and happy yeah even though they they have very simple lives yeah? so everywhere where we sit down talk to people they're very happy for us to take their photos Okay. Now we're coming to the last part of my uh, of a uh, uh, nine day trip now. Eh? So from Bamboo Grove, where we were staying at the in Indo Hockey Hotel, eh? we are going to go to uh, towards Varanasi. Now Varanasi is quite a distance away, as you can see on this map. It's a uh, almost an eight hour trip. Eh? For us, if we actually had the change in plan. So we actually had to travel at night and this was actually quite, uh, you know, like uh, for us, this trip felt quite long, you know, imagine being on the bus for eight hours. Uh, but if you were to do this trip, you'll find this is the longest stretch of it. But uh, when we got there, we stayed at Taj Ganges Hotel, very nice hotel. Again, I can show you. Okay. So if you look at it, this is actually like, a, I think a four or five star hotel that we stayed in. Again, I emphasize. When you go to a trip to um, Indian pilgrimage, it's actually a very comfortable trip. Everybody should go, you know. Don't feel that it's something that you 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 are reluctant to go because you know you uh you the impressions of India is not a very like um, comfortable place, it's not not correct at all. Eh? Varanasi. Varanasi is a place that we went to this day and then um, we use this as a staging point for us to go to Sarnath, which is quite nearby. Eh? Uh, this is a typical... Uh, Varanasi is very famous for their fabrics. So we went to a place where they were selling fabrics. You can see uh, for someone, the camera again is very interesting because there's a lot of colors in it. Eh? Uh, this is Varanasi. Varanasi, this is the road towards the Ganges River. It's very, very messy and you see everything on this street. Eh? Uh, rickshaws, people, motorbikes, cars, cows, everything. Um, we took a rickshaw ride. Rickshaw ride, yeah. And you can see yeah, the, the streets are very messy. Yeah? It's actually very scary when you're in a rickshaw because you are a relatively, uh, uh, you know, small vehicle and there are a lot of other distractions going around you. 
Now, this is actually coming to the uh, Ganges itself. Now, the Ganges itself, I think from the Buddha's perspective, uh, it's, it's important because the Ganges is a very important spiritual uh, river that's recognized by uh, um, people of the Hindu faith. I think during, during uh, the Buddha's time, it's also a very important time because, you know, where he traveled, is many parts of it is up and down along the Ganges as well. Eh? So we went to the Ganges in the evening. Again, very beautiful place for you to go with your camera. Right, look at this. Eh? Very, um, this is the typical photo that we get of Varanasi. Eh? Again, you know, I think many photographers will go just stay in Varanasi for a few days just to get some photos. For us, we just went there for one evening. Uh, we took a boat out and we, we did a puja on the boat and we, we offered some uh, floating floating uh, lights and candles onto the Ganges River. Yeah. So again, you look at these photos. Huh? I can imagine if I had more time there, you know, if I can go in the mornings and then go during sunset and going during the evenings, you know, this place is just an amazing place for us to take photos. Huh? Uh, this is another video, it's a quick one. Okay, so that's uh, how we spend the evening in, in uh, Varanasi because after after uh, eight hour um, bus ride, eh? 
So the next day, we we stayed in a very nice hotel called uh, the Taj. And then we went to a Sanaf. Sanaf, I think, was only like a 20 minute, 30 minute ride away from uh, Varanasi. And uh, this place is important, obviously, because it's a place where the um, Buddha gave his um, uh, first sermon uh, to the five disciples. Uh. Uh, Sanaf, the other name that it goes uh, by is Sapatani. Eh? Okay, uh, there's an Asoka, there's remains of an Asoka pillar there. And this is uh, the, we circumambulate the, uh, the Damika Stupa. Yeah, this is the Damika Stupa. Okay, so this is the main uh, holy site that we would actually go to when we visit uh, Sarnath. Eh? Um, we we took the time to um do a puja at the time and obviously we did the dhamma chakra pavatana sutta uh, that uh at, at this holy site yeah? so again i think when you go to these uh places of um uh, uh holy sites uh, is that you can actually do you can actually recite the original suttas that were that originate from this site i think gives it a very special um reverence uh, when you have the opportunity to do that yeah. Okay, so going around the stupa, and then we took a group photo at the end of it. Again, I think this place, um, if you have a bit more time, is also very nice because you can go there, you can spend the day there. You know, the, the grounds are very big, uh, very peaceful, uh, and uh, you uh, you can actually uh, visit the different places uh, very carefully. Yeah? At the same time, close to this place, there is the um, the museum as well. There's the museum of a, of a, a Buddhist Buddhist museum as well. Eh? Just very close to this place. Eh? I don't have any pictures of it because at the time when I wanted to go into the museum, they told me that we cannot could not bring our cameras. Eh? But keep in mind, yeah, uh, the museum is definitely worth uh, visiting. Now, next to this uh, Damika Stupa, you walk a bit further, you, got, you, you come to this Mula Ganda Kuti. Eh? So Mula Ganda Kuti, I think this, this is obviously not the original structure there, but uh, Mula Ganda means the original Kuti. Eh? So at, at one point, eh, imagine after the Buddha had like, uh, give his first sermon, he had five disciples, eh, they actually formed the Sangha there and they actually had a place of uh, worship there. Eh? And that started the Mula Ganda Kuti. Eh? So this is actually the supposed site for that place. Eh? Now, one thing I have to stress is the, you know, all the holy sites in India, the Mahabodhi as well as this site here, is under the Mahabodhi uh, Society. Eh? The Mahabodhi Society has actually done a lot for Buddhism in terms of, of, keep, of uh, maintaining the holy sites as well as making sure that it's a site that's well maintained and uh, pilgrims keep coming back, you know. Before in the 1850s, imagine the Mahabodhi and places like this, you know, they were left in this in ruins, you know, they were not looked after. And even the Mahabodhi at the time was actually a uh, a uh, Hindu temple. Eh? It was actually used as a Hindu temple. And then un under the uh, under the guidance of Dhammapala uh, Angarika, eh? he actually went through a movement, realized that these are important holy sites. And he actually sued the uh, sued the government uh, to actually retain control of the Mahabodhi uh, holy sites uh, back into Buddhist uh, uh, Buddhist uh, uh, control, uh, so that these sites uh, would actually be promoted as Buddhist sites rather than just being left uh, as places that uh, that people do not uh, look after and have no significance. Uh. So if you read it up, the Mahabodhi is actually a very important society in uh, in um, in the Buddhist um in the buddhist community so this is the buddha image at the uh in the temple you define the temple is not very big but you go in there it's very busy it's very crowded we we managed to go to the uh, temple next the mahabodhi society temple next to this place is just like uh two blocks away and we actually met with the chief uh, chief abbot of that place uh. And again, it's very good when you actually go to these places with Bante because he knows everybody there. They're all Sri Lankans. 
and uh, we go in there and we are well greeted and then you know we have our cup of tea in the morning and we get to you know get the, the chief's blessings eh? so uh, at the baha bodhi society you know they have a lot of photos in the in the in the in their main hall and if you look at the photos there you will recognize eh, one of the photos if you look at the photo at the bottom uh bottom middle there you see uh there's a photo of our uh late chief there so it shows that even the late chief uh, is uh, a very important person that has promoted buddhism not only in malaysia but around the world and he's well recognized he's got books published and he's done a lot in terms of like promoting buddhism in malaysia as well as around the world yeah so uh kudus there you know uh, you, you you go to one of the holy sites you still find the photo of the of a late chief in there okay. so we took a group photo everywhere we took a group photo um uh, just coincidentally you find that when you go to the uh uh sana you find this buddha image uh, this buddha image is also in the uh, museum and i think it's one of the oldest buddha images that you can find eh? uh it's and you look at the mudra the mudra is the 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 way that the hands are, are put it's actually got a significance eh? this uh, mudra there is actually a teaching mudra eh? so you find that uh, at this site sarnath you have this mudra i'll show you one more video Sarnath. This is a Sarnath. Eh? Okay, good. I think we're, I'm doing uh, okay with time here. I had 280 over slides and Nanki last uh, the last few slides now. So after India, that was the last place we went. Eh? And then the, on coming back, when you come back from uh, India, um, it's the way that the the flights are scheduled. You have to you have to stay at least one day in uh, Bangkok. Eh? So in Bangkok, we visited uh, Wat Suthan, which is actually uh, again I think. Um, Thailand in itself is a very good place for Buddhists to to visit now, yeah. So that's our group here. You can see the the you know the everybody's happy because you know 
we, you know, for after eight days of uh, having curries, this is the first time we had Chinese food in Bangkok. Eh? <laughs> so this is our group here. This was the last, uh, you know, this is actually the, the we, ha we had this uh, conclusion um, a meal before we actually uh, parted on our own ways. Eh? And it was a very good, like, uh, finale to our trip. Eh? So just to let you know, you know, that was actually the first trip we went on. Uh, 2020, I was supposed to go on the second trip where we would have gone to Lumbrini as well as Kuzinaga. So hopefully, you know, like uh, at some point you know, next year, you know, we will get to be able to go on this second trip. Eh? But I, for all of you who've like uh, shared, uh, followed my uh, sharing for today, please do make aspirations to go visit the holy, the four holy sites. Eh? It is definitely a very, very good uh, important spiritual as well as enjoyable trip. Thank you.